welcome to the October the 5th, 2017 session in our series on international technology management. This year our theme is on the rise of commercial space businesses in Asia. I'm Richard Dasher. I direct the U.S. Asia Technology Management Center. I'm the instructor for this course. I'll be the host for the sessions this quarter. I'm happy to say that this is our 25th anniversary. The first set of these seminars we put out was in 1992, and uh, we have continuously de delivered them ever since then uh, with a different theme every year. And uh, what we'll be doing this year is to really look at some very interesting activities and projects that are going on related to new businesses that are connected to outer space. So this is not just sending rockets up into space. This involves everything from communication systems that involve satellites. It might even get to the point where we talk about insurance for space activities. Uh, because as space becomes more commercial, all of these kinds of things will start to play out. So welcome to everyone. This is a public seminar. We're delighted for you to be here. If you're a Stanford student and want to take it for credit, there are two big requirements. First is regular attendance in person here. Um, we do have two excused absences. And so if you're sick or if you've got a job interview, take that as an excused absence. If you're, for instance, on a Stanford sports team or you have a required Stanford class that conflicts with this class, send me an email and I can probably waive the on-site requirement. If it's your fault and you miss more than two sessions, send me an email and we'll work out a makeup assignment. So it is possible. The other requirement is a weekly comment on the content of the session. This is due within two weeks of the session by email to me. This is how I can keep in personal touch with everybody who's taking the class. And I really enjoy reading your comments. Sometimes we share them with the speakers, but before I share them with anybody else, I would ask your permission. Um, but uh, anyway, there's one excused no comment session during the quarter, which means that if you're missing a session in person, we are planning to put up a channel on YouTube to show these videos of each session publicly. And so assuming that gets set up the right way, you'll be able to watch the video and still send me a comment on that session. And of course, if we get into trouble, we may have to be flexible. Uh, but that does mean that we're videotaping the sessions. And by being inside the room, you agree that what you say may show up on the videotape. So please be advised that this is not exactly closed like a normal Stanford class. Um, but in any case, as we look at the uh, rise of commercial space activities, we have two absolutely the right speakers to uh, give us uh, their comments and to engage in interactive question and answer with us during this session. First of all, uh, I'd like to introduce on uh, Skype, joining or not Skype, on Zoom, <laughs> joining us from Wellington, New Zealand, is Ms. Emmelyn Pat Dahlstrom. And for 10 years, Emmelyn has led a space consulting practice called International Space Consultants. She's also on the faculty of Singularity University and was the former chief impact officer for Singularity. Uh, she's now in New Zealand on an Edmund Hillary Fellowship from the New Zealand government that is supporting her, sponsoring her to create an incubator for space businesses in New Zealand. So Emily is our first panelist. Hi Emily, how are you? 
Okay, great. We've got audio. Uh, our panelist who's with me here at Stanford is Dr. Rick Jaruso. And Rick is a long-term contact. We've known each other at least 20 years. And he is uh, the managing director of Finance Technology Leverage LLC, which means he's on the investor side now. And he is also a serial entrepreneur who has started at least three or four companies that I know of, probably more than that. And one that's especially relevant to today is in the mid-1990s, Rick was the founder and then essentially the chief operating officer for a company called Rotary Rocket. And this was really, I think, the first commercial launch services company ever, ever created. Uh, and so Rick is going to start out with his comments first uh, so that he can kind of give the really broad background flow to uh, the rise of space businesses. And then we'll switch and we'll ask Emmeline to give her comments. It's, it's great to be here today. Um, I'm curious how many of you have followed the space industry and find that to be something that's, that's particularly of interest to you? Oh, good number. Okay, fantastic. Um, so what I want to do is just spend a few minutes and kind of give you a broad overview. It's, it's the long picture of how, where we've been, uh, kind of where we are now, and maybe a little bit about where we're going. So this is really just going to be a very broad overview. Uh, I think this will hopefully sort of set up the, uh, uh, the rest of the series that you see, which I think will be more about specific things that are kind of going on now. But this will kind of set the context for that a little bit, I think. So it's a great quote Robert Heinlein had, which was that uh, once you get to Earth's orbit, you're halfway to anywhere. Is a very famous science fiction writer and made that, uh, made that comment. The point being, if you can just get a few hundred miles that way, you're halfway to anywhere in the solar system, which is kind of a, a hard thought to, to think about, except when you realize the gravity well we're trying to get out of is really, really hard to get out of. But once you're out of it, it's really not too hard to get, to get anywhere else. And that's kind of the, uh, the comment here. So the problem that we're trying to solve when we talk about anything involving space is really just the first few hundred miles. It's just getting from here to there a few hundred miles. Uh, and then everything we do beyond that is, is uh, really much, much simpler, much more straightforward. The, um, the original stuff having to do with, with space was actually, uh, goes back to like the 1940s with the, the X programs. And how many of you are familiar with Chuck Yeager breaking the sound barrier? That was, uh, that was actually October 14th, 1947. So that's the 70th anniversary of that next week which is really astonishing um, to, to, to think about. That's the, uh, the plane he flew, uh, the Bell X-1. It was the first in a series of, uh, of planes that were basically just designed to go faster and higher and eventually uh, sort of lead up into, uh, you know, lead up into space. So that was kind of the, the concept, right? So we just faster, higher, can we fly faster, can we fly higher? This wasn't that long after the Wright brothers when you think about it. Right? The folks who were working on this remembered the Wright brothers. So, you know, pretty, uh, uh, pretty, pretty ballsy. Um, but then uh, something happened. And in 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, which was the first man-made satellite. And that was actually 60 years ago yesterday. And that scared the crap out of the Americans. Because at the time, we were in this Cold War with the, uh, with the Soviet Union. And the idea that you could put something up into orbit, or that you could put something up that high, meant that you could deliver it anywhere on the planet at will. And it may not be as benign as a communication satellite. So that was pretty scary. Uh, and, you know, if you think about it in, in today's context, we see the stuff going on with, um, with North Korea and Kim Jong-un, and we see these, you know, these missiles, these firing that are kind of going farther and farther, and, and uh, you know, this, at this time was, you know, the height of, of all the research being done into atomics and, and the hydrogen bomb and everything. So the idea that the Soviet Union could do this was really quite frightening. Uh, and then just a few years later, that was followed up when Yuri Gagarin became the first person, the first human being, uh, to 
uh, to get up into space. So the Soviets were, were getting ahead of us, and this was quite frightening. That was actually April of 1961 when that happened, and immediately thereafter, uh, President Kennedy basically announced, okay, well, we're gonna, we're gonna show them, we're gonna go to the moon. And we're gonna go to the moon because if we can go to the moon, I mean, that kind of blows away just putting somebody up a few hundred miles, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's a quarter million miles away. If we can show that, we, we show our military dominance. And so this completely changed the way we looked at uh, space launch and space flight. From a system that was, you know, airplanes kind of going faster and higher to something that was really designed to demonstrate our military superiority with missiles. Completely changed the way we looked at launching things into space, completely changed how it was funded, completely changed everything about the industry uh, to something that was basically fundamentally about showing that, 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 you know, if you think you can put a bomb anywhere, well, so can we. Well, to put this in perspective, how many of you are familiar with the different satellite, you know, sort of distances, LEO, GEO, are these familiar concepts to you? Okay, well, it's not familiar concepts to most people, so let me just give you a few. Uh, LEO, or low Earth orbit, is just, a, is just a few hundred miles this way, straight up, okay? This is when you see the picture and you kind of see the curvature of the Earth and you're kind of over Florida. That's low Earth orbit, that's LEO. That's where most of the stuff we do is, and with the exception of the moon missions, that's where the people have always gone. That's, they've always just gone to LEO, that's where the space station is and everything, right? Um, there's also uh, a, a property of satellites kind of going around the Earth, which is they take a certain amount of time to go around the Earth. If you're in LEO, that time is on the order of 90 minutes to go around the Earth. The further out you go, the bigger the radius gets, the longer it takes to go around. So if you're at the moon, that takes 28 days to go around the Earth, right? Because the moon is way far out, it's a quarter million miles. Well, it turns out there's a distance between those two where it takes exactly 24 hours to go around the Earth. And of course, the Earth spins in 24 hours in one day. So if you put a satellite above the equator and you get it going in the same direction that the Earth is spinning and you put it at the right distance, it appears to always stay in the same place. And we call this geostationary orbit because it looks stationary from the Earth. And this is when you have a, a satellite antenna in your home maybe that you point to get television, not the dish, because that thing moves, that points at everything, but you know, something, a dish maybe you have at your home, that's usually what you point at is a, is a geostationary satellite. So that's the picture of the Earth from geostationary orbit. You see sort of the big blue marble. You can see pretty much half the planet, okay? And then finally, there's the, the, the view of the Earth from, from the moon, which is sort of a classic picture taken by the, uh, by the Apollo astronauts. And you can see it's, it's, it looks like the moon from Earth. It's kind of way far off, okay? So just to give you a sense of it, when you're talking about LEO or GEO in particular, or what's called cis-lunar, which is CIS lunar, which is anything sort of between here and the moon, this is what these different, different orbits mean. There's also MEO, which is kind of between LEO and GEO, but we don't need to worry about that right now. So, so what we were saying is, okay, you put something in LEO, we're gonna put something on the moon. So you can see it's a really big difference. So that led us to the, to the Apollo programs, and Apollo 11 in particular, which was the first one that successfully put somebody on the moon, and that was in July of 1969. Uh, and you can see this is a, um, uh, this is the, the rocket that they were on, the Saturn V rocket that they were on. You can see it's just a huge missile. And that's, that's what we were demonstrating was that, uh, that superiority. So at this point, we'd accomplished what we wanted to accomplish. We put a guy on the moon, we demonstrated our military superiority. Now what? Now we hit what I kind of call the lost years. And there's about two decades where there's a lot of stuff happening, but not really. Um, it's just, more, more stuff being done by the government, uh, Skylab, the space shuttles. Uh, it's, it's a lot of expense. And we shift from, in the, in the government sector, we shift from a decision about where to manufacture parts from decisions being made based upon, uh, for example, who's going to make the best rocket engine. We shift to decisions about where things are made based upon who has the most important congressional district. Not a terrific way to run a uh, high-tech engineering enterprise. Um, and unfortunately, that, the, the results, both in terms of cost and in terms of success, ended up bearing that out. The space shuttle was designed to be a reusable vehicle. Uh, it had to be, 85% uh, of the parts had to be swapped out after every flight. You think about something that's like an airplane, you're gonna fly 747 from here to London, 85% of it has to be swapped out after every flight. It's, it's completely insane. And the, um, 
uh, the number of signatures it took of NASA engineers, 1.5 million to turn that thing around. 1.5 million signatures to turn it around. In fact, there's a, there's a story which I'll, I'll tell you which was kind of funny. So there was one time this thing uh, was sort of, it would land, right, and it'd land horizontally, take off vertically. So at some point it has to go like this, it has to be raised up, right? So uh, there was a time when it came down, it landed, they're doing a bunch of stuff, then they have to raise it up. And they go to raise it up and there's this gigantic clang sound, which you, know, you can hear like a mile off. And it turned out there was a uh, 18 foot long bright yellow beam inside it with big red letters that said remove before making vertical. And fortunately, 11 people had signed off saying it had been removed. So that gives you a sense of kind of how, how things were going at that time. It wasn't, wasn't great, but stuff was kind of advancing. Well, then a magical thing happened. Uh, the Cold War ended. Now, the Cold War ended, um, I was actually a graduate student here at Stanford when, when this happened. Uh, and um, you know, we kind of looked at that and we said, well, this is kind of going to change a lot because we're no longer w thinking the same way or, or worrying about the same things. And this creates an opportunity now to actually make this go back to what it should have been all along, which is commercial endeavors and not just military. So enter what we now call sort of new space or the, uh, the rise of the, uh, the, new, the new enterprises based upon a commercial approach. And in uh, January of 94, um, uh, just as, as an example, uh, we started working a lot on this. I was actually in what's now called management science and engineering and doing stuff involving decision analysis. I don't know if any of you know Ron Howard's group or, or what we do there, but we were thinking a lot about incentives, games, things like that. So a colleague of mine, Gary Hudson and I, proposed this idea of using prizes to incentivize people to do research. Um, and at the same time, we started work on a private, uh, a private spacecraft company, basically, rotary rocket company. Well, two years later, May of 96, uh, within two weeks of each other, the X Prize was announced, which was using prizes to do this, and uh, rotary rocket was born. And this was, there were, there were some other companies at the time. There were actually a total of three other companies at the time. Uh, so we weren't the only one. But the fact that I can say there were exactly four companies at the time worldwide tells you how small it was. We could fit everybody that mattered in that entire industry around this table very, very comfortably. Uh, that's how small the, the industry was at the time. That, uh, that prize incidentally was then won uh, in October 4th of 2004. It was just interesting how everything seemed to be this week on these different things as I was kind of putting this together and I began to realize that was now the uh, uh, the 13th anniversary um, uh, uh, back then. And I actually have, my, my son is here in the audience and I actually have pictures of him because we were there uh, when it happened, of course, because uh, we were there for that. And I, I thought about putting an embarrassing picture of him as a, as a, as a young kid up there, but then decided against that. So, uh, but that was, that was pretty exciting. Well, now all of a sudden things start to take off and we start to see a whole range of companies ranging from uh, X-Core Aerospace over there on the left, to United Launch Alliance over there on the right. Uh, X-Core's little tiny scrappy company actually spun out of our company out of Rotary Rocket. United Launch Alliance was formed by the uh, merger of the, of the launching systems of, of Boeing and Lockheed uh, to create United Launch Alliance. But that was, uh, now we start to really see things start to take off. Now, when I, was, uh, uh, when I was at Rotary, I was flying out of London one day, and there was a rocket ship there. It was a sign, it was marketing by Virgin, and it said, space is Virgin territory. And I thought, he better put his money where his mouth is, if he's gonna say that. Uh, so I ended up arranging a meeting with Richard Branson, and uh, going and talking to him and convincing him to come in and be part of this new industry, be part of the space industry. He obviously jumped on that, although it took him a, few, a little bit of time, but, but he, he came into that. And this is where you really start to see the, what I call the cowboys and robber barons, which is to say the billionaires that start to kind of participate in this. And the first one was actually Paul Allen. He had been involved from a very early time. He was co-founder of Microsoft and very interested in doing all sorts of advanced research. Uh, and then quickly thereafter, um, uh, uh, Richard Branson got involved. And then, of course, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos 
and Elon Musk uh, also came along with Blue Origin and, and uh, SpaceX. And there's actually others as well. Uh, but these are the ones that are, that are quite well known. And so we start getting into this period where there's a lot of this sort of uh, billionaires financing something because, uh, because it's really cool and they have too much money. Uh, the old joke in this industry is how do you make a billion dollars? You start with two and invest in aerospace and you end up with one. Um, and then not long after, now, now we're at a point where actually we're starting to see venture capital flow into this. And you see a lot of companies, and I, I started to put them up here and then realized there's actually tons of them. And gone are the days when I can say there were four companies and they could all fit around the table. I could not possibly name half of the companies that are, available, that are, that are around in this space right now. Uh, it's, it's astonishing. There's just tons of people starting to do stuff now. And it's really actually uh, what gives... Uh, what gives the next speaker her, her business in consulting is that there's now, now, now a market for this stuff, right? So, so that's a little bit about the launch side. On the satellite side, uh, I'm only going to say a couple of words because I think that's what you're going to get a lot more of uh, momentarily. But I will just say this. Historically, satellites were, were very, very large. They looked like this. You can see the people there, very small next to the satellites. They take years to build. Um, I've actually just... Uh, our firm has just bought one of these satellites, uh, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's something that costs uh, you know, half a billion dollars. They're, they're expensive, they're big, uh, they take very large orbits to get to, or very large rockets to get into orbit. Uh, because there's so much risk attached to them, the insurance is expensive. Because there's so much risk attached to them, you don't use cutting edge technology because you really need to make sure that everything works, and so you end up using technology that's frankly really old. Uh, but you need to spend a lot of money, big capital investment, you need it to last a long time. Now we've moved towards satellites that are dramatically smaller. Uh, CubeSat, this little one down here is by Planet, it's called a Dove, it's actually about the size of a shoebox. It looks a lot better than that picture, but it's, I could hold it in one hand, it's tiny. Um, they're simple to design, simple to launch, you can manufacture them on this tabletop right here, very easily. You don't have to have a big clean room and a big, a big facility like you saw in the last picture. Uh, you can just send up lots of them. You don't care if some of them fail. You don't care what happens to them. They're going to degrade really quickly, but they're really cheap to make and really cheap to put up. And there's a lot of stuff you can do with them. Not, not, not all the same things, different things, but there's a lot of stuff you can do with them. So as a result of that, we're seeing a lot of changes in what people are doing and what people can do. And if you look back at sort of the payload trends, over this time period that I've just, just sort of laid out for you, early on, what were we putting up? We are putting up anything that flies, anything we can get up there, right, in the, in the very early days. And then soon after that, it was basically government employees, often for military and, 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 uh, and those types of purposes, occasionally scientific purposes, but a lot of it was military. And when I say government employees, that's kind of a, a coy way of saying, you know, astronauts, NASA astronauts, that sort of thing. And then... As we got towards the 90s, we started to see LEO satellite systems really start to take off. Larger satellite systems, lower to the ground, really start to take off and have a different type of uh, market that they could go after. We always knew tourism was a really potentially huge market, but we're actually starting to see it now. We're seeing people actually pay and go, and we're seeing more and more and more planning for that sort of thing. And I've had uh, several business plans that I've looked at just in the last week from companies that are, that are looking at doing that. Of course, Space Adventures has been around for a while, has been doing it, but, but more that are really getting serious about it, including some really serious businesses around habitats. So creating actual space stations and creating, um, uh, you know, creating places where people can live and work and visit and, uh, and, and exist. And that's just super, super exciting to see this. So this is now all starting to kind of come together. So the transition is nearly complete at this point. We started with very early exp experimentation with the Bell X-1 and, and that sort of thing. We moved into what is, I call the military proxy. Uh, and then sort of the rich, rich hobbies, rich hobbyists, you know, sort of the bleeding edge technology. Now we're into sort of the early adopters and, and early business opportunities. And then into the operational infrastructure phase, which is where things are just, it's just investment in making it happen. And I think that's where we are. We're right, right now sort of between these two, these two areas. So we've moved from this very, very early, and we've watched this whole technology come all the way to, to now it just takes investment and just takes people doing stuff, and there's a lot to be done there. So the question is, where do we go from here? And that's my last slide, because that's for you guys to answer. That's not for me to answer. I have ideas. We invest in stuff, as, as Richard mentioned at the beginning. 
we set up FTL for the purpose of investing in particularly interesting areas, and this is one of the areas, space, space and technology infrastructure, that we really want to advance. So this is what we do. But we won't be the ones creating those business plans, you will. So that's it, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Rick. And uh, so I'm going to turn the microphone over to Emmeline and ask if you'll give your comments. You've got your slides uh, that you'll show from your side, right? Okay, well, uh, thank you very much again, Dr. Dasher. Uh, I know that uh, it's a bummer that I'm not there in person, but for sure this is really a great opportunity, and, and thanks for, for inviting me. As uh, was mentioned, um, essentially, um, just to give you a little bit more of an understanding of my background, I'm originally from the Philippines. I'm both American and Filipino, um, and I've lived all, uh, half of my life in the Philippines, essentially. Uh, the later, at uh, the beginning stage, like, you know, I, I caught the, the space bug uh, when I was a kid and never really recovered. And so for the, the last uh, sort of like three decades, I devoted my life to um, helping kind of like uh, have private access in, uh, to space by either consulting or working for space companies like Space Adventures and uh, Odyssey Moon Express, uh, Express uh, to actually working on educational uh, technology and space uh, ecosystems like the International Space University. And I had a chance to also uh, write a book a few years back on like, where we're, we're looking and heading. And so uh, I'll spend the sort of like the time here uh, really on key uh, major uh, things is one is to why is there a resurgence in the space interest in the activities like today? Um, what is really driving that? And then uh, what's happening uh, and, how, and kind of like how do you break into that industry for those emerging countries, especially in Asia? Um, and then the last part is like uh, just kind of like an overview of like what's happening in the Asia Pacific region, both in the public and the private side. So again, um, as, I, as I mentioned uh, as well, uh, working on educational um, uh, like institutions uh, down the road to Stanford, like I've been involved with Singularity for the past like eight years. And uh, for those who are familiar, uh, basically what we do is we leverage exponential technologies to solve uh, you know, humanity's grand challenges. Uh, they don't necessarily equate to the UN Sustainability Development Goals, but um, they, they're, they sort of like are very uh, uh, synonymous. But at the same time, also, we look at space as a grand challenge as well as an applied technology that could potentially solve all of the others. And the reason why I, I point this out is that, um, you know, we don't only look at uh, technology um, but we, all, we actually look at disruptive and essentially accelerating exponential technologies. So this means that, you know, with Moore's law, um, you know, every 18 months, uh, essentially the price performance of computing has been doubling. Um, and essentially any technology that is powered by computing is therefore then um, developing at an accelerated pace. So which means that computing networks, artificial intelligence, nanotech, and uh, digital biology, uh, all of those um, essentially are, are also accelerating. And what is the implication of this? Well, basically, exponential technologies has democratized access to space, which I think is the reason why there's like a resurgence, especially in the last kind of like five years uh, in terms of the industry. And just to uh, uh, give a few of these examples. So we think that uh, essentially exponential tech has dematerialized space, goods, and services. This is one example. In the past, you know, you have weather ground stations. You need to uh, basically launch like 100 million satellite up and then also build a ground station that is like half a million dollars to be able to get uh, weather data. But today, um, you know, uh, you can actually buy a software defined uh, radio, which is like this really small thing here. Uh, I bought this in New Zealand and essentially the chip uh, here mimics the ground station that uh, used to cost like half a, half a million dollars. Um, and with also open source uh, GIS, people can actually download this information and also analyze uh, as well if you have an internet and laptop. Another example is uh, hyperspectral imaging, which has been around for ages uh, as well. But in the past, you know, you'd have to basically send up uh, almost a billion dollar of a refrigerator type of, of satellite to actually get that data. While today, it has now been reduced 
to a chip that's as small as your thumb. And um, one of our alumni from Singularity, for example, Hypercubes, uh, which is up the road um, in South San Francisco, is going to be leveraging uh, this chip and putting it in a nano uh, sat um, to have more revolutionized and dis disruptive type of uh, remote sensing uh, data. Other examples is that uh, basically exponential tech has also demonetized uh, uh, goods and services uh, in space. So here's one example, another um, alumni from Singularity who's created this, uh, this company uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, essentially, he's got an app store um, where in five minutes you can configure your nanosat and then in five days he can deliver you the actually fully integrated um, platform. Um, and everything is essentially created in-house. Um, another example, which most people probably uh, uh, know more about, is Planet. So this one is circa 2010. It's in the, uh, the Rainbow Mansion in, in Cupertino. Uh, these guys were used to be faculty and staff uh, members uh, as well of SU. Uh, they started out um, by basically uh, launching uh, you know, smartphones and uh, realize that they actually work in space. And so this is basically you know, the beginnings of now the biggest uh, nanosat uh, Earth, uh, Earth uh, observing a constellation um, on Earth now. They've uh, already uh, uh, sent up like about 220 um, launches of these nanosats. And, and again, uh, these are basically guys in a garage um, in Silicon Valley. And uh, another example, um, so uh, Spire uh, Global is also another, uh, the co-founders and alumni of, of SU, one of their uh, employees actually went to uh, Africa and uh, taught a few uh, 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 high school kids and now potentially the first private satellite um, from Africa it has been basically designed by high school kids. Um, we have another alumni, um, um, who is based in um, Patagonia, and um, he is the co-founder of Satellogic, uh, essentially another constellation of satellites. He's uh, uh, basically launched a few of those uh, sats already, but he's doing this all from uh, basically South America. So essentially what I'm, I'm uh, driving at is that uh, all of these technologies that are now off the shelf that's also um, uh, now available to everybody. Another example is Made in Space. Uh, again, a team project that came from Singularity University. Now they basically have manufactured the first uh, uh, object uh, in space. They have two um, uh, 3D printers uh, in the International Space Station, and their long-term goal is to be able to 3D print basically humongous big spacecrafts um, in orbit. Um, for the future. So what does this mean? Essentially, uh, it created new markets and opportunities for the private industry, which in the past were only um, uh, available to governments and also big airspace companies, uh, you know, from propulsion to manufacturing to resource and mining. These are all now not science fiction uh, because the technology uh, is now off the shelf. Um, and then, of course, all of the big players, uh, as Rick talked about, the ULA um, and then SpaceX and Blue Origin, have also been leveraging all of these technologies in their, in their uh, like space systems. So how does an emerging country actually uh, you know, uh, join the bandwagon, especially I'm, I'm thinking about the Asia-Pacific region? Um, when we look at um, creating a sustainable space uh, industry, there's like a few elements that um, would not necessarily guarantee success, but uh, you would want to have uh, if you actually want to, to join that global space economy. One is for sure progressive governments, um, which now is, uh, uh, we're, we're seeing now that uh, you know, small governments are becoming more interested in the space industry and putting their, their money uh, you know, where the mouth is. Um, and also, like location-wise, as well as a, a, say essentially an important thing, and then educational uh, tech and entrepreneurial ecosystems and community for sure. 
Uh, but then there's also challenges to this because all of those are different stakeholders. They need to be integrated together to actually work together in a more cooperative fashion uh, rather than you know, competitively. And then, of course, in terms of like uh, entrepreneurs, there's also we need to make sure that you know they get the funding, the resources, and the network um, that they will need kind of like uh, to be successful. So what we've looked at here is like essentially uh, there is a roadmap uh, that needs to happen for us, uh, you know, an emerging country to actually uh, be successful and create a, a sustainable um, industry. And it goes all the way from capacity building uh, to um, essentially uh, having a successful businesses that, um, that are, have public and private partnerships. And so you start with education. Uh, essentially, uh, today, there's been traditional um, educational institutions like uh, in the International Space University. There's a lot of universities like Stanford that actually have degrees that uh, you could go to um, to be able to uh, be um, you know, part of, of that uh, kind of like this, the, the space industry. Uh, but today also, education has been disrupted. Um, and so there's like non-traditional ways of uh, actually getting and breaking into the market from uh, online education to vocational training to even um, essentially virtual uh, space accelerators that are now actually available um, online regardless of where you are in the world. The other thing as well is like once you've, you've gotten the, the, the talent, then you know, incentivize uh, those entrepreneurs to actually work on ideas and projects that are focused on, on space. Um, and so, like today, there are not a lot, uh, or actually I, I, I don't even, um, I haven't seen one that is like really uh, focused on birthing like space companies. Um, Singularity University has this global solution program during the summer where we actually uh, bring together entrepreneurs uh, to work on uh, projects. And we have had uh, a bunch of successes you know, from Alien Space Fire and, and um, Saddle Logic to um, actually work on space companies. Uh, but then there's also, also as, as Rick mentioned uh, uh, as well earlier, uh, prizes are a great um, uh, catalyst for actually creating um, an industry and, and creating startups as well in the space um, uh, sector. And so XPRIZE, for sure, is, is one of them. Uh, NASA has been doing space apps for challenges for a while. And uh, uh, SU is also uh, works on global impact competitions where you can actually have themes, which could be space. Um, and then the third one is like, how do you then um, uh, assure that uh, these startups uh, can actually thrive and, and be successful? And so you need to give them like the tools and the resources and most uh, most importantly, the funding. Um, and so here, this is just like an example of the breadth that is kind of uh, uh, available today. You'll get my slides, and so you'll be able to kind of like uh, look up each of, of these. But essentially, uh, there's like public or government-based uh, business incubation centers now, like ESA, um, to help like startups work on space projects. Uh, but then there is also a bunch of now new uh, organizations like Singularity University and then also uh, several ecosystems like in Berlin, New York, uh, Singapore, uh, who are also uh, trying to drum up like uh, interest uh, from entrepreneurs to really focus on, on space. The other thing as well um, is that uh, just in the past like uh, year or so, there are also uh, investors and funding um, organizations that are also looking at maybe innovative ways of trying to fund, um, you know, startup companies. And because it is really risky, and then if you also are looking at like long-term uh, um, sort of like uh, return, um, it is a, a very different animal. Um, but then uh, there are newer funding mechanisms right now that are. Uh, that could be leveraging like blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies um, that could potentially uh, help you know, in doing this. And then the last thing um, is like, how do you really make that that those startups uh, become really viable businesses? And so again, I think the, um, the reason why it is now the time uh, 
or, or is, is much favorable is that because of these exponential technologies, it has demonetized, dematerialized, and, and uh, democratized the access. Uh, it is a, a lot more easier. Um, and then also, if you can actually create those uh, ecosystems either within nation or within region, then that might also ease that, that um, kind of like process as well. Uh, the last thing I talk about um, is, um, as I mentioned, essentially is just kind of like an overview of uh, what's happening in Asia Pacific um, in terms of uh, space. So uh, this uh, basically uh, talks about, you know, the, and again, this is government, so uh, not, uh, not commercial yet, but there's about $62.2 billion as of 2016 um, in terms of expenditures of uh, at least 65 uh, countries all around the world who actually put uh, money into the space industry. And there's about 16 of those are, of course, from the Asia-Pacific region. Um, here's just kind of like an overview of the national space agencies uh, again. And as you can see, um, China and India and Japan has always been there um, sort of almost from the beginning. Uh, we, you can sort of like say that they are sort of the superpowers in the region uh, in terms of, um, of uh, space. Uh, the rest of the other Asia Pacific nations have like basically satellite development um, and operations for either air observing or communication satellites. Um, one thing to, to note is like India, for example, uh, today has probably the cheapest like launch um, uh, like pricing for for access to launching a spacecraft and, and satellites in space. Japan has, has been uh, also a a big um, sort of supporter of the International Space Station collaboration. Uh, one trivia is that um, essentially they have whatever that they they promise even from the very beginning of what their contributions are never actually changed even though the, the partnerships from other countries have shrunk their their sort of like contribution so therefore now the the contribution of JAXA um, is actually at par even greater than some of the uh, ISS partnerships and of course China uh, as well has been um, a major uh, mover in either uh, human space flight. Now, now they have uh, two space stations, independent space stations, up uh, up there. Um, has gone to uh, to the moon um, um, and uh, essentially is working on uh, a lot of uh, planetary and 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 also um, like human space flight uh, initiatives. Going to the the uh, commercial side. Um, just, this is just to point out uh, here that most people think that governmental um, activities are way bigger than commercial, but actually uh, commercial is about you know five times more um, than uh, than the civilian government market, um, as uh, as you can see in this uh, slide. And here's just an example. And again, this is not exhaustive, but um, I kind of like. Uh, um, put some examples of what is happening in the, uh, the private side in terms of space initiative in Asia Pacific. Um, most of them are, of course, in the launch capability uh, side. There's, there's some from remote sensing. Um, there's development and manufacturing on satellite and sensors, um, and then operations uh, as well. And most of these ones that I put here are, are actually either really small or, or startup companies. One thing to note um, in terms of launch capabilities, um, and actually depending on who is uh, who is counting, there's about 11 countries uh, to, today globally that can, that can actually has like launch or orbital launch capabilities, and six of those are in the Asia Pacific region. Just uh, this year, or like within the last 12 months, um, examples here, of course, of rocket labs, which you see in New Zealand. Um, uh, having uh, uh, essentially its first uh, successful launch. They haven't uh, uh, had a successful orbit uh, insertion yet, uh, but then uh, their second launch is going to be uh, this, this month. Um, Japan also uh, interstellar technologies uh, attempted to do a suborbital uh, launch uh, in July, um, 
uh, it failed, but at the same time, they're still working on, on it. Even Australia now, um, who's just declared that they are going to create a space agency, also has Gilmer Space Technologies that are doing sounding rockets and are, are hoping to also have um, orbital capabilities. And um, China, which is uh, peculiarly uh, owns, you know, uh, state-owned corporations for uh, their um, their launch um, capabilities, also now have purely private companies that are working um, on either launch capabilities or um, commercial communications uh, uh, satellite or uh, network of satellites. So uh, Landspace is one of them. You can check them out. Uh, Comsat is also a new company from, from China that is hoping to uh, essentially uh, compete with um, commercial satellite uh, um, companies like OneWeb in the U.S., and then there's like small ones that essentially are, are working on either CubeSats or uh, even uh, companies that are looking at space debris um, mitigation and so forth. So one example, so as I mentioned, I'm Filipino. Uh, I was in the Philippines last April um, uh, for about a few weeks. And I'm really surprised uh, as well at kind of like the, the entrepreneurial community. They're like really wanting to focus on space. For one, there was uh, three bills that passed uh, in Congress, and now uh, they have been given the go-ahead to actually create a space agency with a uh, one billion pesos in, in budget uh, for the first year uh, to develop uh, the space capabilities. They're looking at locations now. There's, uh, uh, there's. After I left, there was um, there was a nonprofit organization that was formed where there's now three thousand members. Um, uh, basically um, interested entrepreneurs and, and scientists in the Philippines to work on space projects. And then uh, there's also a group of uh, um, investors now who are looking uh, to create a funding mechanism as well um, to help those startups uh, get off the ground. So essentially, um, you know, the question uh, that was posed for uh, this particular um, session is like, you know, Asia Pacific uh, region, um, uh, is it time? Uh, I think it has already started um, and the, the technology is there. Uh, I think there's a will for, for people. There's a lot of hurdles that needs to be done. But at the same time, it's the same way with the rest of the world where there's, there's baby, baby steps that's happening um, within the commercial uh, world for uh, what's happening. So I, I just uh, close here with just a few slides. The reason why I'm in New Zealand, again, is like I don't want uh, the democratization of space uh, essentially to be uh, put to chance. I want to make sure that there is a global space ecosystem that is uh, going to happen. Um, and so therefore, my focus is on emerging countries um, and actually helping entrepreneurs to make sure that they could leverage this technology to create global impact. I uh, I watched this movie, Elysium. I, I'm sure a lot of you have, have seen this like a couple of years back where, you know, there's the difference between um, the people in, uh, who have the means to actually go up in space and then have left sort of like the rest of the world um, uh, essentially in ruin. And that is like for me my biggest nightmare as, uh, personally. And so that's kind of like one of the reasons why um, uh, as part of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship, um, essentially we're working to create this um, open source uh, community uh, platform that could, all, that could help um, locally just to start the, uh, as, a, as, as a, a project in New Zealand, but can some, something that could be either ported to other uh, emerging nations, especially in the Asia Pacific region as well. Um, the name of the project is Space Base. We're still uh, pre-launch, and so uh, we're working on on um, our own structure and uh, own processes. And um, I will end there. Um, and thank you again uh, for for uh, inviting me to uh, participate, even if I'm um, uh, virtual. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. <laughs> so. I'm going to ask Rick to come join me up on stage on stage again. <laughs>
Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have one question that I want to ask to kind of get things started off. Rick, I'm going to ask you first. So, even back in the old days, when it was all national space programs, there were private sector companies that supplied the parts. They supplied a lot of the equipment. You know, Boeing was one, Lockheed was one. So, a lot of the new energy in this can switch to sort of program to industry seems to be coming from startup companies, not from the big old players who are in the business. I wonder if you would comment on that. Is there something special about the space industry that sort of kept the giants from moving into, the, into more commercial things? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I guess the answer to that is sort of several, there's several pieces to that. Um, you know, one thing, obviously, yes, there were private companies involved all along as government contractors, uh, but there's a big difference between people doing government contracting and, and basically uh, operating under a program of the government in sort of a, a, a command and control sense versus an industry flourishing up and, and sort of the let many flowers bloom approach of, of startups and lots of startups doing things for their own profit motives. Uh, and that's the transition that I was sort of trying to emphasize when I was, when I was talking there because I think that's really what has then created uh, opportunity is now, now we have lots of people doing it for their own profit motives. Uh, but the question then becomes why weren't those large companies the first to do something in that space? And I think the answer is the same reason that IBM wasn't the first company to come out with a, with a PC uh, back in the late 70s and what gave you know, companies like Apple a, a real shot. Uh, and uh, that is when you have a, and, and it's even worse in this industry because uh, as contractors, the way they were incentivized at the time was what's known as cost plus fixed fee. So they would be building something and they would get reimbursed by the government based upon their costs plus a fee on top of that. So if you want to maximize profits under a system like that, you want your costs to be really, really high. Um, as high as you can possibly make them. And then you know, you're going to get the fee on top of that. And so you've got an incentive to design systems that are really, really expensive and hopefully difficult to maintain um, because that makes the maintenance more expensive. Uh, I mean, just think about the entire incentive system under that, under that system was just completely screwy from a private enterprise standpoint. So then when, uh, you know, when we came along and, and we were not a government contractor and the others were not government contractors, suddenly it's a totally different incentive system. You're, you're, you, all of your engineering decisions, everything you do is designed to lower your costs, to keep your costs down, to be easier to do things. It's a completely different approach. And I think that is uh, something that those companies were just completely unprepared for. Uh, initially, and you know, you could just see. We used to joke about with Boeing. You know, Boeing's not going to. You can imagine the, the, uh, you know, the uh, vice president at Boeing that's going to walk into the board and say, "I've got a really great idea. Um, let's design a new vehicle that's going to be really, really inexpensive, or a new satellite that's going to be really, really inexpensive. It's, uh, it's, it's going to replace our entire line. We're just going to cannibalize our entire existing line. Let's just do that because it would be cool." Um, you know, his, he, any of you remember RoboCop, the very end of RoboCop? Uh, well, if you do, go watch it. That's how that meeting would end. Um, he would, he would uh, that, that VP would be out of a job about five minutes later. And, and that's, I think, ultimately what it is. Thanks, Rick. And I have kind of a related question for Emmeline. In this democratization, we're also seeing internationalization. Right? You're seeing the spread to other countries. But there's a huge barrier, and I think that you can hear me, right? Yeah, yeah OK. The huge barrier may be the, in the origins of the space program and its deep connections to this kind of military application. You know, anything that has potential military application as well as civilian application in the United States is restricted by export controls. It's worse than that. Well, yeah, it, it really is. It's a lot worse than that. But Emmeline, how are these countries in Asia kind of getting around that? How are they able to develop things and participate more on an international level? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And actually, it's a complex, uh, uh, well, it's a, the, the answer is complex. For, for one, uh, I wanted to point out as well that there is an incentive for um, actually startup companies and businesses to actually work abroad, meaning 
uh, uh, find funding and, and, and actually develop their systems where they, they are not within the reach of ITAR. Uh, so it becomes an incentive, uh, and I've seen that uh, with several startup companies that I've sort of like mentored uh, as well. Um, in terms of like even with China, for example, where I mentioned this Comsat company um, that is uh, that is working on um, uh, basically a communication satellites. So they are not within uh, ITAR, and, and and so therefore companies that are um, like in, in different regions of the world. Um, can actually avail of their either their their tech uh, development and so forth. Uh, so that's for sure uh, something that that uh, works well for that, for that like that side of, of the uh, the incentivization. The other one is of course on the negative side is um, it, it is it does stunt uh, some of the uh, partner. Um, or, uh, partner countries that actually work with the U.S. and want to work with the U.S. Uh, as well um, for um, making sure that they are kind of like within those like systems and 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 rules and regulations. But at the same time, there are um, there are um, you know uh, programs like uh, SBIR. Uh, it's a government. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on what exactly it's like small business innovation research. Right, yeah, where most of the time they give grants and funding to uh, sort of like organizations and companies that have at least like over 50% stake uh, or, or, or U.S. Um, uh, stake. But at the same time, they, they also have loopholes to, to, to do that with other uh, countries that um, they think might be of, of uh, benefit kind of like to the U.S. to be able to, to partner with. So there's like um, those kinds of things uh, that are happening. And then at least uh, also I think um, in, in terms of uh, like internationally, this, uh, these processes are also um, sort of uh, being looked at even kind of like on the U.N. level. Um, and then there are also uh, member countries that put sort of like uh, tech uh, safeguards and agreements in place um, um, so that, you know, just like, for example, New Zealand ha has one between the U.S. Um, that would be aligned with, with at least with, with the current sort of like ARTA restrictions. Okay. Thank you very much. Rick, you want to comment on that? Yeah. Um. So just just to highlight this this uh, ITAR stuff, there's there's a whole bunch of stuff that starts to play into this that, that I could spend the next six hours on, unfortunately, much to my dismay. Um, but just to sort of illustrate what a problem this can be, I, I actually spend uh, the vast majority of my time outside of the United States, and uh, I, I actually don't spend nearly as much time here in California as I, as I really should and would like to. Um, but most of the investment community that we interact with, most of the people that we are interested in from a financial standpoint are outside of the United States. There's a lot of great technology and such inside the United States. So a lot of times we're kind of marrying those two to a certain extent. Um, and there is a lot in Asia, a lot in Asia, and I can go on about that quite a bit. But the um, uh, there is one project that we just uh, was announced recently that we had financed, and this is a... Uh, uh, a project that is a uh, public partner, a, a public-private partnership uh, with, uh, with DARPA, the Defense uh, Advanced Research Program here, uh, uh, here in the U.S., as well as um, Space Systems Loral and, and our firm, FTL. And it's to put up a satellite that can refuel and service other satellites uh, on orbit. And we're, we're actually the ones financing that, that project. Uh, now, just to illustrate this, this is a project that is pretty much entirely commercial. Uh, there is a small, small defense-related piece of it that has absolutely nothing to do with the project we're financing. Uh, and it's just, but it's, it's related, and so that, that's where the DARPA piece comes in. So as we were looking at putting together that financing, uh, 
one of the interesting things we ran across was that if we had more than a certain amount of foreign investment into that, we had ITAR, ITAR restrictions. ITAR restrictions are having to do with international you know, arms control, right? Not letting technology get to, to uh, other countries that might be adverse to the interests of the United States, if you're worried about these things. And um, generally something I try to stay far away from. Um, but uh, in this case, because of this, this connection to this DARPA thing, all of a sudden we're sitting there going, wait a second, you mean if one of our investors comes in and that investor happens to be sitting somewhere in China or somewhere, somewhere else that isn't you know, a totally friendly investor, totally friendly person, totally friendly group, whatever, but happens to be in the wrong jurisdiction, uh, then it's not just that the technology can't go to that person. It's not just that they can't know certain, what, what you'd call information rights in a company, meaning they can know the, the stuff. They just can't be in it at all, at all. Like they can't have anything to do with it. And that's a really strong uh, restriction when you think about it. And the United States government has put a lot of these types of restrictions in place. And I think it's, it's really not necessarily to the benefit of the industry or even the United States government. And they don't necessarily realize that. But, that's kind of how it is, unfortunately. So I completely uh, echo the sentiments that, that you mentioned and, and just add that this stuff, it gets really ridiculous. Thanks, Rick. Yeah, you need to know what the challenges are. Let's open up the floor to questions. If you don't mind, I'll restate your question kind of briefly so that we get it on the tape, okay? Anybody, questions? Back in the back. Uh, Charlotte, you're first. Uh, well, before you leave IHAR, Richard, you probably know how. How long has ITAR been in place like that, and it's only gotten worse? Not so the question about ITAR, international technology and arms reduction or something like that, something, I, I forget what it stands for. It used to just be called export controls, so I use the old word. And it's been around for a long time. Ever since there was dual military civilian use was a concern for a lot of advanced technologies. You know, it used to be you couldn't bring your Mac laptop to China because by the definitions of the export controls, the, the central processor in it was a supercomputer. So these things have been slow. They don't keep up with technology. It's been a big issue for a long time. And as you say, it just gets worse. Yeah, okay, Let's, but that's that. I saw another hand over here. Go ahead. Okay. I, I see a lot of issues developing as more players get into the space situation. What is the legal environment? Uh, as you have you know, more, more companies, we have a, a law of the sea, but I don't know if there's that, that well developed a law of space, and particularly there's companies that are looking into mining asteroids, uh, uh, creating colonies, I can see a lot of issues there. Uh, a, a secondary uh, issue is people are putting a lot of stuff into space, and of course we've had the experience with the environment here, things get contaminated and so forth, and what efforts are there at uh, building in a cleanup uh, uh, requirement? So if you put something up, and then it stops working, does it just stay up there or do you have an obligation? So I, I'll start with the second one. We're planning on a presentation later in this series by a company that does debris removal from outer space. So we have that <laughs> planned. But I want to ask Emmeline about what you think in regard to the situation with the legal framework. Who has jurisdiction even in low Earth orbit, right? Nobody owns outer space. And so uh, how, how is that affecting the development of commercial businesses? So um, I, just to, to, to let you know, I'm, I'm not the expert on these as well. However, um, there's definitely uh, um, you know, regulations uh, in place, like the Outer Space Treaty, um, where uh, like basically nation states have the jurisdiction of either what they're launching um, and then also if there's something that happens to what uh, is launched, uh, then they're also liable to, um, you know, uh, if it actually uh, does any harm to any, uh, what it actually comes down and, and, and does any harm uh, back on Earth. Uh, so th there's there's a governing body in the UN that actually uh, looks at uh, all of these. The regulations have been put forward like way back since the 1950s, 60s, um, and 
some of them are also, of course, kind of like outdated. Like uh, right now, uh, there are, for example, uh, companies like um, planetary resources and uh, deep space industries that are looking to mine the moon um, and, 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 and asteroids. Uh, and so, but there are um, essentially um, agreements in place in, in the past where there is even um, essentially uh, dispute over how do you interpret uh, th uh, that because that uh, right now, uh, for example, nation states are uh, essentially not, the, um, they can't own uh, sort of um, anything that is out there. Uh, but then that doesn't necessarily mean that companies, for example, uh, who actually either go to the moon or go to an asteroid, uh, they don't necessarily um, like own the, the, the land, but that they could potentially mine uh, uh, minerals and then bring it back to Earth. Uh, so th there's like those kinds of things that today, uh, yes, there, there are um, meetings in the UN that are actually uh, talking about uh, all of these and um, these are things that were not foreseen in the past when uh, when the, the, the technology and the capability was not was uh, was still not available to commercial companies as opposed to nation states. Thanks. I think that's a good answer. I'm. Uh, I think that some of this will get taken care of as we deal with problems of cloud computing, where you don't know what country your data is in. So, you know, the privacy laws differ from country to country, and that's a big issue. So we'll muddle forward. But the interesting thing is business is probably going to lead the way, and the government will have to figure out how to deal with it as it goes along. Another uh, question. Can, Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Uh, in the early days of this, we actually, uh, my, my partner actually made the mistake of standing up in a conference at one point and asking the question, which federal agency of the United States government regulates the new launch, emerging launch industries? 17 different federal agencies raised their hand and said, we do. Uh, if you've ever done anything involving a startup, the idea of one regulatory body scares the crap out of you. 17 regulatory bodies is just a death sentence. There's, there's no way you can, you can uh, surmount that. So the first thing we actually had to do in those days was actually get the laws changed and get the regulations changed uh, to make this a much more reasonable process. And so for launch, that's now regulated by the FAA in the United States. Uh, but there's, um, and, and those regulations we actually, we actually wrote, those regulations that now everybody's able to operate under. Um, and I learned a lot about how that process works in the United States, which was sort of interesting. Um, the, uh, uh, the other thing, though, is a lot of this stuff is actually regulated through a different form, and that is bandwidth or, or spectrum. Um, a lot of the satellites going up, they, they require spectrum. They need to communicate with each other. They need to communicate with the ground. And that is regulated by the ITU. Uh, and various countries, like the United States has the FCC, They'll have their own process, but then on top of that, the International uh, te what is it? Telecom. International Telecom Union uh, actually regulates the entire thing uh, from that standpoint. So, so a lot of this stuff is kind of regulated. When you start talking about mining asteroids and things like that, I think at the end of the day, the only regulation you're worried about is who can actually touch you. So if you're on Earth doing it remotely, you need to worry about the people here who are regulating you and think they can tell you what to do. But if you're on the asteroid, I don't think there's a lot of regulation there. Thanks. Ed? Yeah, a question for Emily. Um, from the perspective of Asia, can you tell us what you think the top five applications or opportunities are going to be in space? So the question is, what are the top five opportunities or applications in space, especially for an Asian company? And this is for you, Emily. Huh. Yeah. Um, well, for one, uh, I think uh, essentially data data analysis um, and remote sensing is uh, for sure um, one of the biggest ones to, to think about. And the reason for that is that there's going to be a lot of uh, like Earth observing satellites and constellations that are going to be put up in the, the next five years. Uh, there's going to be basically a humongous amount of, of uh, data that's going to come down where uh, there is a... Uh, there's definitely a, a, a lack of um, essentially data analysts and um, organizations that 
even like process that data. Um, and of course, remote sensing uh, as well and data analysis can be done anywhere too. So just like the, the way I always uh, have the, the analogy of like in the past, you know, Asia became good telemarketers because it's something that because of the, the, the internet, you can actually do telemarketing anywhere around the world and, and you can be either in India or the Philippines and do that. Uh, that's uh, essentially one thing. The other thing as well is uh, sensors and components. And so uh, there's like this big, huge uh, sort of missions that are being laid out by you know, SpaceX and, and the Origin and uh, you know, ULA. Um, they, uh, those are like big ones that, that they're focusing on launch capabilities. But at the same time, all of those components of, of those missions from life support systems to the, the, the small, um, uh, sensors and equipment to even robotic precursor missions um, that uh, now there's like off the shelf technology that can actually be leveraged um, to help small startup companies be uh, like focusing on niches. Um, you know, you could be like in New Zealand and be the premier um, uh, sort of manufacturer of uh, one particular sensor um, that is like needed in Earth observing satellites. Um, so there's there's a lot of um, I, I think um, uh, places or, or, or technology today that for sure has been democratized uh, that can be looked at. VR is another uh, VR AR uh, you know um, uh, which uh, and, and uh, AI uh, kind of capabilities for sure which are portable. Um, can also be something that can be looked at and and uh, potentially be a, a specialization um, in the Asia Pacific, where of course even China um, and and India are already kind of like ahead of the game sometimes um, uh, from kind of like the rest of the the, the world. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Emlyn. You know, I hate to say it, but we're out of time. For those of you who are here, we've got some light refreshments outside. We'd love to encourage you to stand around and, and talk with each other and, and find out more. We've got a great session coming up next week. It's two companies that are competing for Google's Lunar X Prize, the team from India and the team from Japan. So anyway, we'll uh, talk to you next week. Thanks so much, Emmeline. Thanks, Rick. Okay, bye.